Thank you for the opportunity to present today. My name is Katerina Wells and I'm a staff colorectal surgeon at Baylor University Medical Center in Dallas. So though leaks are a rare event, they carry significant morbidity both in the short and long term and have a mortality rate as high as 15%. They result in increased length of hospital stay and readmissions. They have a negative impact on local recurrence and overall survival in the case of oncologic resection and the pelvic fibrosis from local infection also result in long-term anorectal dysfunction. With this in mind, strategies at, pre at prevention are paramount, but when the unavoidable does occur, early assessment and intervention can mitigate some of these negative outcomes. A grading system for colorectal anastomotic leaks was developed by the International Study Group of Rectal Cancer, where grade A anastomotic leaks are identified radiographically in the absence of clinical findings, and these can be most often managed expectantly. Grade B leaks require therapeutic intervention, but not necessarily reoperation, including antibiotics and percutaneous drainage. Um, but emergent experience with stenting and endovac are also gaining popularity. Grade C anastomotic leaks require relaparotomy due to the presence of sepsis. Of course, the most important factors for a technically sound and successful anastomosis remain splenic flexure mobilization and high ligation of the IMA and IMV to ensure adequate reach of the conduit as well as good perfusion and good tissue for anastomotic creation. For the purposes of this talk, we're gonna briefly review some specific technical considerations for prevention, but we're also gonna discuss efficacy of management strategies for early identification and treatment. Assessment of adequate perfusion can be performed by many different strategies and is usually more of a gross assessment. The use of fluoroangiography within designing green perfusion is one more recently discussed measure that may offer some benefit to assessment of perfusion with comparable rates of morbidity, uh, namely leak, compared to standard practice. Pillar 2 is a multicenter trial that compared fluoroangiography to standard practice for colorectal anastomosis, and it reported a change in surgical plans in 8% of the cases, with the majority of change occurring at the time of proximal margin transection. The Pillar 3 study was designed with an interest in the low colorectal anastomosis, However, this study closed early due to low accrual, but did report comparable surgical outcomes to standard practice. Though there's new, no clear evidence to support a benefit of fluoroangiography, anecdotally, the use of it is easy, especially on the robotic platform, and the presence of good perfusion generally corresponds to the site of grossly good uh, tissue perfusion, and it only reinforces operative decision making. So I do use it when it's available. Leak testing is a basic tenant of left-sided anastomosis and reaction to a positive leak test will reduce the likelihood of a clinically evident leak from a reported 7.7% to 3.8%. The choice of surgical intervention favors anastomotic revision and diversion over suture repair alone, but of course, judgment should be applied, especially in the low colorectal anastomosis where revision may just not be technically feasible. There is value in endoscopic assessment in combination with traditional insufflation leak testing as demonstrated in a prospective review of 425 patients where 15 of 17 patients with an endoscopic abnormality had a positive air leak test with a reduction in the leak rate to 2.1% after revision. Endoscopic assessment also offers the ability to assess for perfusion intraluminally with or without fluoroangiography and to also assess for hemostasis of the staple line. Consideration to perform a prophylactic diversion should be applied to those at higher risk. In addition to the known patient risk factors of malnutrition, immunosuppression, and radiation, diversion of the ultra-low or coloanal anastomosis mitigates serious postoperative morbidity, as demonstrated in 2013 Nesquip review. The choice to perform a diverting ileostomy versus colostomy for diversion are equivalent on the basis of Cochrane review, with each option having its pros and cons. A diverting ileostomy carries the risk of acute kidney injury, and the relatively flat configuration of a loop also presents pouching complications. On the other hand, ileostomy is associated with a significantly lower rate of prolapse, and it typically requires a minor and easier procedure for reversal. A loop colostomy proximal to the anastomosis carries the risk of marginal artery damage with creation and with reversal, and may place undue tension on the pelvic anastomosis, but it definitely offers better function and pouching for the patient. My preference is to perform a diverting ileostomy due to the ease of reversal and reduce risk of compromise of anastomotic refusion. The use of pelvic drains has no diagnostic or therapeutic benefit relative to anastomotic leak, 
And this is supported in two large meta-analyses published in Annals of Surgery in 1999 and colorectal disease in 2004. Though there are other appropriate indications for pelvic drains, the routine use for the purpose of early identification or reduction of clinically significant anastomotic leak should be discouraged. So even when the technical steps go seemingly well and preventative measures are taken, anastomotic leaks happen and we're none of us immune to them in our practice. We're gonna cover strategies for early detection and treatment in the next half of this talk. Routine postoperative monitoring of inflammatory markers shows promise as an adjunct to standard postoperative monitoring. On meta-analysis, procalcitonin when normal by post-op day five has a negative predictive value of 95 to 100%. When CRP remains elevated by post-op day four in the absence of clinical symptoms, the sensitivity of a CRP-guided CT scan is 76.7%, with a negative predictive value of 78.8%. Interestingly, though, in this study, the 118 patients with a low normal CRP who were not scanned had an infectious complication rate of 50%, demonstrating some limitations in inflammatory marker monitoring alone. Nevertheless, the, studies, uh, the authors of the study appropriately call for consideration of CT scan and certainly delay of discharge in the setting of an elevated CRP by post-op day four. When compared to each other, CRP is more accurate than procalcitonin for the detection of infectious complications owing to greater variability in procalcitonin values. The microbiome is an emerging universe of research that may offer some insight in the microscopic level regarding the bacterial profiles present in the case of leak. The University of Chicago identified commensal E. faecalis collagen degrading activity and host matrix metallopeptidase 9 activation in a rat model of colorectal anastomosis. And this information may offer promising tools for early identification and hopefully more targeted strategies for prophylaxis and therapy in the future. In the clinically stable patient with a contained leak, Percutaneous drainage is an appropriate first measure, provided a safe radiographic window with a large enough and homogeneous fluid collection can be accessed. Pathways for percutaneous drainage can be transabdominal, transsacral, and sometimes transvaginal, but caution should be applied when penetrating other organ structures at the risk of persistent fistula. For low pelvic anastomoses, transanal drainage with a large malencot catheter can allow for internal drainage until the defect has organized and decreased in size. However, in the case of clinical deterioration, surgical intervention with either diversion or revision is needed. Revision should be reserved for significant dehiscence greater than 50 to 100%, or in the case of ischemia or necrosis. Barring these findings, diversion is preferred and it can be performed with a minimally invasive approach. The use of endoscopic self-expanding metal or covered stents is reported in case report and series with some success, and it can be used as either an adjunct to percutaneous drainage or for the primary management of otherwise inaccessible leaks. This is most effective when paired with adequate drainage of the extraluminal component of the leak. Um, however, stent migration is a common complication necessitating routine close interval x-ray and or digital examination if that's possible. This is a patient of mine with a frozen abdomen and iliorectal anastomotic leak. Diversion was not possible and the anastomosis ultimately healed with the use of a covered stent. Stents are also useful in the case of significant disruption of the colorectal anastomosis, where it can be used as a temporizing measure so that elective surgery can be planned in a fairly clean reoperative field in the future. The use of endovac is well established in foregut surgery and is gaining application for colorectal anastomoses. Though heterogeneous in the selection of studies, a recent meta-analysis showed a success rate of 85.3% with a stomal reversal rate of 75.9%. The mean duration of therapy was 47 days. Our institution and others report similar success in the setting of diverting ostomy. The overall complication rate in retrospective review is 19%, but these complications are attributable to the nature of the leak rather than the application of the endovac, and it's a fairly benign therapy. There are no commercially available endovac products avail um, in the US, but they can be easily fashioned from wound back equipment, a nasogastric tube, and proline suture. Below is a diagram of my institution, um, my institution's uh, publication on the construction of the endovac, and uh, the size of the sponge can be tailored to the size of the defect at each exchange. This is an example of the anastomotic healing that can be expected from endovac use. This is a patient of mine with a posterior ileoneal pouch leak. 
The defect was opened using a linear laparoscopic stapler and serial endovac treatments were performed under diversion. You can see in the top middle row, uh, this is an open, uh, fresh uh, anastomotic defect. Uh, and in the bottom middle uh, image, uh, there is complete endoscopic healing. Uh, he was successfully reversed at this point and has good pouch function. So in summary, prevention is paramount and requires meticulous surgical technique. Early diagnosis can be aided by inflammatory marker and possibly other biomarker testing in future. Conservative therapies are appropriate for contained leak in the stable patient, but you have to have a low threshold for surgical intervention in the case of clinical deterioration. Thank you so much for your time, and I'm happy to take questions at the panel discussion.